All right, good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Kim Allen and in my class we have this great speaker series where we are so lucky to be so close to so many great people in the community. And today we have Donna Baker. She works in real estate and she's going to share her experience, her path, work path, education, and then a little bit about real estate. So if you're one of my students, lucky you, you get to get a little snippet of something that is so important as you uh, move into adulthood. Thanks for being here today, Donna. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me again. This is my third time or fourth time? I think third. Third time. Excellent. But this will count as four times because we'll show it to four classes. So then oh, you'll be okay, up, great, you'll be great. Yeah. great. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Donna Baker, and I have been in real estate for 20 years. Uh, before real estate, I was a, an administrative professional. I worked for CEOs and presidents of companies who actually gave me the um, information and background that I needed in order to run my own business when the time came. So real estate was never something that I um, had on my list of um, occupations that I wanted to do and uh, sort of fell into it by accident when I lost my job in a high tech internet incubator. And a friend of mine said, you should sell real estate and never sold anything in my life. And I thought, how do I, how, why would I do that? And uh, talked to my husband and sure enough, we all got on the same page and I decided to get my license. So um, I had taken some real estate classes in college that helped me. And by the way, I did not go to college after high school um, because the career path that I took did not require that. So all of the education that I needed was from high school. And so then later on, when I got involved in uh, corporate uh, companies that were you know, above what I had known, I did enroll in junior college. So I did graduate with an AA uh, later on. Uh, and that definitely did help my uh, going up the ladder as quickly as I did because I did have a college background. Even though it wasn't a bachelor's, it was still some college. And that helped get me uh, moving up the ladder uh, at the companies where I work. So anyway, I got into real estate 20 years ago. And believe it or not, at that time, uh, they were just going onto the computer. So um, because I had been a secretary in high tech companies, I knew how to use the computer much better than most real estate agents because that's all they had ever done was real estate. And they really didn't know how to run a business from a marketing standpoint, from an organizational standpoint, um, and just you know knowing how to uh, work people and negotiate. And you know it was just a, a very good background for me when I got into it. And so I had my own website before any uh, real estate agents in this area had a website because I knew how to do it myself. Uh -huh. So that was, you know, everybody kept coming to me saying, who, who does your website? And I was like, um, I do. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, I didn't know how to do all the bells and whistles. So when I got successful, I really needed to hire somebody to do it. But for the most part, I got started on my own with a little bit of money, I had gotten laid off. So I had severance pay. So I was able to market myself because I knew that's what I needed to do to stand out from the crowd. And the crowd was much smaller then than it is now. Um, now everybody wants to be a real estate agent and there are more real estate agents in the country right now than there are houses for sale. Wow. So yeah, I think there's like seven, 70,000 or 700, I don't know exactly how many agents there are, but that's a statistic it. that they gave us uh, a couple weeks ago that it. there are more agents than homes available to sell. Um, we are right now in a seller's market. And so what that means is that um, when you're going to sell your house, um, you're going to have a lot of attention and a lot of offers. And so, um, and real estate is cyclical. So it goes up and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down. So people tend to think that their house is a bank, and that's really not the intention of owning real estate. If you can own real estate, it's a long-term investment. It's something that you have to understand that you can't use it as your bank, that you, you stay in your home or you keep your investment property 
for five, 10, 15 or longer years. And, um, and then you, you make money at the end instead of taking money out all the time. That's how people got into trouble back in 2008 and 2009 when we had the mortgage meltdown. So um, I was very lucky. I succeeded very quickly. Uh, my first year, I was number 11 in the office. And then every year thereafter, I have been the top producer in my particular office um, for the last 19 years. So um, I love what I do. I think it shows I'm very passionate. Um, you have to have a good personality in order to do this because you have to have people want to work with you. So I try to make it fun for everybody, um, but also let them know that I have the knowledge that's necessary to make everything happen the way it's supposed to. So um, I, that's probably enough about me, but I was... Um, I would love to answer any questions you guys have about real estate, about what it takes to buy a home, about what it takes to be a realtor. Um, you should know that every realtor is a real estate agent, but not every real estate agent is a realtor. And so that means that if you have a realtor after your name, that you actually belong to uh, the National Association of Realtors and Realtor is a trademark. So it's a registered trademark and people um, don't use it correctly. They use lowercase r and it's actually a, a trademark. So you have to use a capital R. Interesting. And um, if you're not a realtor, then you don't have a lot of the benefits that the rest of us have. So if you're gonna get into real estate, I highly recommend that you join all the organizations that you need to join. The thing people don't tell you when you get into real estate is that it costs money to make money, right? So um, I have to pay three, three dues. I pay Arcadia Association of Realtors dues. I pay California Association of Realtor dues. And I pay National Association of Realtors. Right there, that's like 300 something dollars every quarter. So- every quarter, uh, right, you know, not every year, right? Every quarter, yeah. So we get, we get charged dues from all of those um, associations every quarter. We pay it through one you know, group effort, but- so they don't tell you that. They don't tell you that you have to market yourself. So you have to spend money on marketing materials. So I do a lot of postcards. I send a just listed postcard whenever I list a home. I do a just sold postcard whenever I sell it. Um, I work with some buyers. I'm very fortunate that I ended up being more of a listing agent. And that's where I represent the seller side and not the buyer side. Occasionally, I do get buyers. I did have a buyer's agent that used to work for me that did that side of the business because working with buyers is very labor intensive. You have to go meet them at the property, and sometimes you want to see five in one day. Um, sometimes, I mean, it, I had one client, it took me three years to find them the perfect home. Ooh, yeah. So it's not like you're going to get rich quick in this business. You can do well, but you have to be dedicated, passionate. Um, know what you're talking about and be able to have people put their trust in you. Mm. Wow. All right. Yeah. I have a lot of questions coming in. Great. Um, I just love being able to share this information with people who are 17, 18 years old, like about to jump off and do these things. They really want to know, need to know. It's very exciting. Somebody asked, how do you pass your real estate exam? She heard it was hard to pass. Okay, so um, in order to take the exam, you first have to have a real estate certificate. So that's an um, online study course, self-study, where you take the classes online. Now, um, that's now. I think uh, there's four I, classes, right? There's eight classes. Eight. Okay. Eight classes. And each class talks about something different with real estate. And I will tell you that the things that you learn in those classes and the things on the test are never things that you do in everyday real estate. It's so ironic that that you you have to know all this stuff, like how many square feet is in an acre. But I hardly ever sell an acre of land. You know, it's it Monrovia, right? Matter. It's irrelevant to what I do every day. So, um, but so then you have to get that certificate. Once you get the certificate, you apply for the test. When I took my test, I actually took a weekend crash course. The week before the weekend before my test date. And then they actually just throw questions at you for the entire weekend, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. 
and their keywords. So that really did help me pass my test. And I finished before everybody else did because I knew what the keywords were and I was able to take, in fact, I went through it twice because I thought I'm done too fast. Um, and they don't tell you what your score is. They just tell you whether you passed or not. Mm. Right now I'm renewing my license. You have to do that every four years and you have to do continuing education. And then you have to take a, a final exam. And I think right now it's like 11 different categories like ethics and trust funds and greenhouses, you know, green energies houses. And so there's a whole bunch of um, professional standards. So we have to take all those courses and pass all those tests every four years. So Did it's not like once you take the test, you're off the hook. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing that all those people you said that have the way too many that have their real estate license are doing that too. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think it's not as hard as people uh, assume it is to take that test because there are way too many realtors. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, part-time real estate is something that people think they can do successfully and really you can't. Um, this is a full-time job. In right. fact, I work seven days a week. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't always work eight hours a day. It's not a corporate job where I go in at a certain time. I take a break at a certain time. I take lunch at a certain time. Um, it's, it's, you know, you're at the beck and call of your clients. So if your client wants to go see a house at 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning, you have to be available. Um, and if you're working, you can't do that. If you have a regular job, you can't do that. So I highly uh, recommend that if you're going to be a part-time agent that you try to get a job working underneath a, a top producing agent who may need some help part-time rather than to go into full-time it's really not a yeah. part-time job I agree there's a big difference in quality I've experienced absolutely yeah and they make us look bad when they don't know what they're doing you know I mean yeah. I, I had a guy that recently that got a listing and he had never done a listing before and in this market he had 27 offers on a on a, a first time buyer price range home. And he didn't just didn't know how to handle it. He didn't even respond to me and I had written an offer. So, I mean, it, it can get overwhelming. Yes. So you, you have to be able to focus on what it is you're doing every single day so that you don't screw up. Right, right. Okay, here's a question. What's something you wish you knew before buying your first home? Uh, what I really wish I knew is that it was, I'm going to go with the double. What are some tips you have for, for buying? Okay. Yeah. So, um, of course, when I bought my first home, it was in the eighties. <laughs> so, um, houses were a whole lot cheaper and it was a whole lot easier for young people to save up their money to buy a home. And, um, I only had 10% down, which was okay at that time. Um, now they have loans that are lower down payments, three and a half percent, five percent. But in this crazy seller's market, you're not as attractive of, of a buyer if you have less down payment. But um, I wish that I would have known that it was going to be much easier to make those payments than I thought. So it's very scary when you buy your first home and you think, oh, my God, you know, how am I going to make these payments? And I'm never going to you know, be able to go out anymore. I'm going to live on macaroni and cheese for the rest of my life. Um, but it actually was so much easier than I thought. And we were so happy that we had done it. So, uh, don't let, don't let it scare you, uh, but save your money, start saving your money. Now, if you want to be a homeowner, by the time you're 30, I'd start putting money in a bank account and make that your house account and just don't even take any money out of it. Just keep putting money in until you have enough for, I mean, ideally you'd like to put 20% down. So on a $500,000 house, you know, you need to put what? What's twenty for ten thousand dollars, right? A hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, hundred thousand. Yeah, so that's a lot of money to save up. So you got to start now. Yes. So can you describe the process if someone wanted to buy a home? They come to yeah. you. Sure. So you find your realtor, um, and the realtor is going to tell you the first step is to get pre-approved with a lender. And most realtors have um, relationships with lenders. And so they will probably refer you to somebody that they know that they can work with and then they know they can get the job done. So I have a favorite lender who actually came to your class the last time I spoke just before we shut down for COVID. That was like 
was great. You, you shut down the next week, right? And she answered a lot of questions about credit too. It was yeah, amazing. yeah, she did. Um, and so, uh, so you get your um, pre-approval from your lender. You're going to have to have good credit. You're going to have to have, um, you know, stability. You're going to have to show pay stubs and tax returns and things like that. So you have to get yourself established. So that, and, and you know, maybe that's getting a credit card when you're just in college or just out of high school and establish your credit early so that when it comes time to buy a home, you have a high credit score. But um, so you, once you connect with your realtor and your lender, then you're ready to go look for homes. Uh, I sign you up for an automated email, which sends you listings every time a new home comes on the market that matches the criteria that you've given me. Um, and then we go look at them. We make appointments and we go look. And then if you like it, you make an offer and um, it's competitive right now. So you really have to put a really good strong foot forward right away at the beginning. And you may have to do your best when you write your first offer. Um, and sometimes that's not gonna be enough in this market. Now, when it switches and it mo moves to a buyer's market then the buyers are sort of in control and they can say, well, we want you to do this and we want you to do that and the sellers saying yes, but in this market that we're in now, sellers don't even have to make the repairs that the buyers request. They're just, you know, at the mercy of the sellers. Wow. Most sellers, most sellers are um, negotiable and they, they want whoever's going to buy their home to, you know, love it as much as they do right. and to have an attachment to it, um, unless they're investment people. Um, but most sellers have uh, attachments to their home and they want to give it to somebody who's going to keep that love going in the house you know yeah they want it cared for and we used to do love letters what we what we call love letters okay. and uh, so that would be where the buyer would write a letter to the seller and say you know we saw your home it's so beautiful I want to raise my children there we're going to get married and raise our kids and live there forever and now um, because of uh, all of the um, civil unrest from last summer and the possibility of discrimination um, we have been discouraged from using those letters now because it would it invites um, fair housing uh, violations. Oh yeah. So that, we're not doing love letters anymore right now. That makes sense. Yeah. I heard someone, um, an HR person, came in and they said any resume that comes in with a photo, they throw it away right away. Yeah, exactly. And that's what people would do. They would take a picture of their family with the wife and the husband and the two little kids that were two and three. You've and done that. Yeah, I've done it many times. <laughs> so I uh, can't do it anymore right now, at least. I believe it. You never, ever want to put yourself in a situation where you're um, going to get accused of violating fair housing. So right. we're, we're definitely anti-discrimination um, and always have been. And it's a very big part of real estate is making sure that um, you don't get discriminated against, that your clients don't get discriminated against. Um, and, and we're very adamant about it, very vocal about the fact that fair housing is very important to anybody in real estate. It's wonderful. And then once the offer is accepted, what happens? Okay. So let's say you do get your offer accepted. The first thing they're going to do is open escrow. Escrow is a third party company that handles all the paperwork for both sides of the transaction. So it's their job to, to make sure that everything is uh, transparent. So each side sees the same exact paperwork, except for the personal information like social security numbers and income and things like that. But um, each side sees the same paperwork and then escrow handles the funds coming in and going out um, to the title company. Um, and then while we're in escrow, and it could be 30 to 60 days, um, while you're in escrow, you do an inspection. And that's usually uh, by default 17 days, but in a seller's market, I always shorten that down to seven to 10 days. Um, so you hire an inspector, the inspector comes into the house, he looks at the top, the bottom, the in, the out, underneath, over, uh, the roof, the plumbing, the air conditioning, the electrical, and, um, and then they give you a report. And the report says everything's good or, or these are the things that are health and safety related that you should address. Then the buyer puts a request for repairs together, asks the seller to do that, they can also ask the seller to do termite work if they had a termite inspection done during that time. And that has to all be settled within 17 days or seven to 10, whatever the, you know, the time frame is. In that same time, running concurrently is the appraisal. So the lender calls the listing agent and has an appraiser go out to the house. 
and make sure that it's worth what they're paying for it. Not what their, what their mortgage is, but their total purchase price. Um, and then if it doesn't appraise, then there's a whole bunch of options to address there. And then once the appraisal is done, then the financing has to be um, a contingency for financing. Contingency means that this has to happen in order for this to happen. So um, the appraisal is part of the financing. If it doesn't appraise, then you can't get the financing. But once everything is put into place, that's day 21. So from day 21 on, you're just waiting for escrow to close. So the first 21 days are really hectic and you're moving and you know, you've got the agents trying to coordinate the inspector and the buyer and the seller and you and the other agent. It's a lot of, a lot of moving parts that you have to really keep up with. So, and I, that's why people think they're going to get in real estate, get rich quick, make lots of money and do no work. That's not true. <laughs> and then when escrow closes, then um, sometimes the, if it's owner occupied, if the home is lived in by the owner um, and they usually have three days after escrow closes to move out and then you get the keys on day three and the house is yours and you move in. Very exciting. That's and you live there for 10 years at least. That's the fun <laughs> part. Yes. Here's a good question. Where is, let me, does it matter where we get our certificate from to be a realtor because of the, yeah. Does it no, matter? no, there's all kinds of real estate schools out there. I mean, I was fortunate when I did it that um, I wasn't fortunate. I lost my job, but I was able to take two classes in one day because there was one, these were in-person classes. It was one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So, um, you know, that, uh, that class was really valuable to me. And then they're the ones that signed me up for that weekend crash course. But there are so many online companies now, Anthony Schools and- Allied. Uh, Allied, yeah, there's just a whole bunch of them. It doesn't matter where you get your certificate from. And you were basically what we used to call a secretary. Yeah. Did you ever see yourself going from secretary to the boss? Never in a million years. And let me tell you, I love it. <laughs> so uh, being somebody's secretary um, is really um, helpful uh, to learn how to run businesses. So you see how businesses run in the background. And really, I was the gatekeeper for right. most of my bosses where, you know, right. if you made the secretary mad, you didn't get your meeting when you wanted it, you know, that kind of, that kind of stuff. But it, it did offer me the opportunity to learn a lot. And I loved what I did. I was very good at that. And I was a very highly paid assistant. So, um, but yeah, I, you know, it's it, whatever you can do to learn how to deal, how to work with people. Yeah. It, this is a definitely a people business. So you have to be good at relationships. If you're shy, you're probably not going to do well in real estate. Mm. Or if you don't want to break out of your shyness, some people are shy, but are willing to yeah bust out yeah yeah I, I was never shy I think you can probably tell <laughs> one of my first jobs was administrative assistant basically a secretary at an Ivy League university in the PR department so I learned such a formal way of communication of email of how we manage the office it was so formal which is so perfect now for my students it's yeah. actually helpful. I can teach them how corporate works. What's funny is that when I look back at my experience as an assistant, um, I was around, <laughs> probably they don't even know what a fax machine is, right? <laughs> I was around when the first fax machine was invented. Uh, so I'm really old, you guys. <laughs> I, I actually uh, um, was lucky to work for high tech companies when I was an assistant. So we had email in the 80s the company I worked for. It was just between our three locations. One was in Washington, DC, one was in Atlanta, and one was here. And we were able to email each other internally, you know, the intranet. So yeah. right, here's a question that I see in a few different ways. So I'm going to try to lump it together. How do you find clients and networking and how do you handle those relationships, like interpersonal relationships? Okay, um, that's a very good question. And that's where people have a hard time um, getting started because they don't know how to start. 
So uh, I was very fortunate in that the company that laid me off, uh, two of the women there wanted to buy homes and they were willing to let me be their agent, knowing that I knew nothing and we all kind of learned together. So my first two sales um, were buyers and um, I learned a lot in those first two um, transactions. But my my advice, if you want to get into any kind of a marketing um, job where you have to market yourself, is to get involved in your community. So before I ever got into real estate, I was very um, involved here in Monrovia as a volunteer. So I got involved with the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club and you know those kinds of things. I was a historic preservation commissioner. So I had what they called a sphere of influence. Um, and so I was able to create a database of 300 people right off the top of my head, which were people that I worked with through the city, people that I, I knew through the volunteer efforts that I had done, people I had worked with previously, people I went to college with. I mean, there was a, there's a whole list of people you know that you don't realize you know. So I put together that whole database. And because I was a historic preservation commissioner and I got into real estate, I had a niche. And a niche is always a really good way to get into a business is to target exactly uh, you know, one portion of the audience. And so my target audience was people that owned old homes. So um, historic properties, craftsmen, Spanish, Victorians, those kinds of things. So what I did was I actually got a mailing list from the title guy that I work with of everybody in Monrovia that owned a house built before 1940. And so I just mailed to them constantly, constantly, constantly. And you have to touch somebody seven times before they remember your name oh. and they recall who you are. So spending money on getting your name in front of people is the most important thing to do in real estate, especially if you don't have a large sphere of influence, go to chamber of commerce events, network with professionals in the, in the area that you work in, um, work underneath a top producer when you first get started so they can introduce you to people. We have a caravan at, when we're in person for the Arcadia Association of Realtors very important for new agents to go to that caravan meeting every Wednesday and meet the re real estate agents because that's also part of the process. And part of the reason you succeed is you establish relationships with other agents. And then they know that you're able to get the job done. They like you and they'll take your offer over some guy from Riverside who they've never met. So um, it's a relationship business all the way around, not just your clients, but everybody that's involved, the lenders, the title guys, the you know, the, the escrow officers, everybody. It's, it's very important to have relationships. And I'm lucky that I was able to, I mean, my first listing was a, a seller who wasn't my seller, um, heard me showing his house to somebody else and knew that I knew more than his agent because it was historic. And so when somebody pulled up in front of their house to ask about it, he gave them my name to to show it to them. So um, I was able to sell them a house, not that house, but another one and get a listing out of the whole thing. And that was my third deal. Mm. So, you know, I've been very fortunate and I was also very fortunate. I got into it before there was a ton of agents. Right. And so I was able to, because I knew how to market myself, I was able to really attack my new career with gusto and um, marketed myself accordingly. Nowadays, there are so many agents. Everybody knows somebody who knows an agent. So so-and-so's mother-in-law or so-and-so's cousin's friend is an agent. And so sometimes it's hard to um, know who to call. But in my opinion, you want to call somebody who has experience. So like if somebody called me from Riverside and they said they wanted me to take their listing out there, I probably wouldn't do it because I don't know Riverside. I can't really tell you what your house is worth because I don't know if you're in a good neighborhood, a bad neighborhood. You know, like in Monrovia where I'm at, if you live above Foothill, your house is worth more than if you live below Foothill. There's that invisible line that it's, it's hard to, to erase for some reason. I don't know why people do that, but um, it, it's a perceived value. And so yeah. when people see that you live above Foothill, your house can be worth more. So you have to know all these ins and outs too. It's not just, um, you know, I'm going to go sell houses. You have to know facts and 
you know, details. Yeah, it seems like specializing and really finding your target market were yeah. really worthwhile. So what I did was after I had um, gotten money uh, from my first couple of commissions, <laughs> this sounds really funny, but I took the ads out at the grocery store here on the shopping carts. I've seen you. <laughs> yeah, so the supermarket pushing the cart and there you yep, are in the yeah and so I got my lender to do the other half with me so we had the whole entire supermarket and um so I was on the front on half the carts and I was on the little bet where you put your purse that little yeah bin there I was on the front of that so you either saw me coming or going on those shopping carts and I was there for about 10 years it wasn't cheap um but because I split it with my lender it was you know half of what it sh- what it could have been. And to this day, I haven't been on those carts probably in five years, but still people say, oh, you're the lady on the shopping carts. So you just never know where people are going to see you and remember you. In fact, I had people go to the shop, the grocery store to get my phone number off the shopping cart. So, you know, you have to do whatever it takes to get your name in front of people if you want to sell real estate. Mm. And networking is also a big thing. You know, like I said, chamber of commerce events, um, I sponsor little league teams. I sponsor concerts in the park. Um, and that's hard to do when you first get started because you don't have any money coming in. But I dedicated every co- commission check when I first got started to my marketing budget. And having a business plan and having a budget to work with are really also key to being successful in real estate. Wow. These are all things I taught my class this year. I feel so validated. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, those are important things to do. Let's take one more question. Um, let's see, I had it lined up. Where is it? What is one uh, a valuable lesson you've learned from your job? From being in real estate? Um, hmm, that's a good one. There's so many lessons. I, I have to tell you in real estate, I learned something new every single day. Um, no transaction is exactly the same. Um, and I will tell you my very first transaction, that gal that I worked with that wanted to buy a house, um, very first transaction, two weeks before we were supposed to close escrow, one of the sellers died. And it was like, oh my God, now what happens? You know, we were lucky that she had signed the grant deed, which is signing over the ownership from one, from one owner to the next. So she had done that, but we had to hold off closing escrow because um, they had to have death certificates filed and that takes time from the county. And in the meantime, the buyer that I had didn't like the lender that she had found to work with. And so I referred her to somebody else and she was able to get a better lender. So it ended up working out, but you know, that was my first deal and somebody died. (laughs) Like, what do I do? So that was just the first time. I mean, uh, this week, I, I made a mistake and, um, you know, I had to admit to it. So that's also what you have to be willing to tell people. Sometimes you made a mistake. Hmm, that's great. You, know, you, you, you can't be perfect all the time. We're not robots, right? We're, we're human beings. And, and yeah. so, um, but you have to be willing to admit it. You can't yeah. just uh, slip it under the rug. Right. Perfection is not a human trait. Right. And, you know, every boss I worked for when I was a secretary or an admin, um, they were perfectionists. I mean, they were. And so they did teach me how to think that way. And so, like, for instance, um, my typical day um, is that uh, like right now I have my pad with my top priorities that I have to work on today. So every single day I have a top three priorities. I'm sure you talk about that too, Kim. I mean, uh, you know, you have to know what you're going to focus on for the day and get those things done first. Don't be a procrastinator. If, you know, if it's important, get it done. Like right now I'm renewing my license. So I just wrote down, finish your tests. I have four more categories I have to finish. Um, Luckily they extended the um, expiration date of my license to June 30th because of COVID. So I was able to, you know, take it a little slower than I normally would, but yeah, every day is different. So oh, I it's hard it. to say what I learned. It's just a whole bunch of things, you know, right. every, you know. every uh, person is different. You can't talk politics ever. 
So I have a very, I have like 3,200 friends on Facebook and 1,300 followers on Instagram and 1,300 followers on Twitter. Um, and so I never, ever, ever get political on any of the platforms that I use. Social media is very important right now too, as you guys know. Um, I'm not a TikTok user. I'm a little old for that, but um, some agents, younger agents are using TikTok too. Um, but I think it's very important that you stay neutral. And I mean, you can have your own political views, just keep them to yourself when you're doing business. Yeah, for sure. You know, I actually do that planning where I list my three most important priorities, but I have not taught it to my class. So I'm really? going to put that out to viewers that if there's something that you think that high schoolers need in a business class need to know, and I do share a lot of personal finance things and all those adulting topics enormously. But add a comment below if there's something else you think, or if you want to ask, is this already taught in high schools? Because a lot of people post, they say, oh, this should be taught in high schools. And I say, it is, it is, right? Well, I don't know that every school has a class like yours because I, I'm very impressed that your class is so all encompassing on life skills. Yes, it's the life you. skills that you don't know when you're in high school. You don't, you know, I mean, honestly, I hated high school. I was not a good student, even though I was, you know, capable. I just wasn't interested in high school. I was, it was, you know, I had better things to do. <laughs> so so um, I did not uh, apply myself uh, at all. Uh, you know, I graduated with a B average, low Bs. Um, and, uh, you know, all I wanted to do was be a secretary. So I didn't really need to go to college. So that wasn't my focus. If I had it to do over again, I would tell you that I would do it differently. Yeah. Um, I hated school. I never went to a prom. I went to one football game the whole time I was in high school. I smoked cigarettes in the bathroom. I mean, I was just really a, um, not involved in school at all. And I wish I would have been now. Looking back, I wish I would have. I would have, I, you know, I see girls going to the prom now and I think I don't have that memory. And it's sad, you know, when you're, when you're growing up, you don't understand um, some of the social things that you learn in high school that I didn't learn because I was a kind of a, you know, I didn't care. I was a rebel. Yeah. I, I didn't, it didn't matter to me. I just wanted to go home and pretend I was a rock and roll star. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and for sharing the path that's so windy and you never know where it'll end up. It's very windy for sure. Yeah. For sure. I never in a million years thought I would be in sales or be a realtor. And, and you can do very well in this business. I, I tripled my income from being a secretary in my second year. Right. So, um, you know, it's, it's possible. It is possible to be successful and, and make a lot of money and live comfortably but it's not part time keep that in mind and you have to you have to pay your dues and you have to learn the ropes and you have to be uh, smart intelligent compassionate passionate and um, know what you're doing mm, beautiful uh, and just last thing before i end the recording is one of my students said please let her know i like her hair Thank you. I know I get a lot of compliments on my hair. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. My pleasure. I hope I gave you a tidbit of uh, information that you can use in your real life.